Ciao. Hi, are you there? Okay, perfect. Yes. So, uh, perfect. Very good. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. And I think that, uh, well, I, I put myself in the, in the raised hand, sorry. So, okay. So, um, very good. So, we are, yeah, we are all here. Very good. So, yeah, we can see your screen. So, okay, you can also um, see the slides. Yes, 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 okay. yes, perfectly. So, uh, okay, so we shall start. So, uh, as you know, Martina will have now her second uh, lesson. This afternoon will be her third one. And Martina, whenever you would like, the stage is yours. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we uh, get started, I'd uh, like to answer a couple of questions that came uh, out yesterday offline. Uh, one was about uh, the uh, choice of the gauge. I, especially during the last part of the lecture, I mentioned many times uh, the, the different gauges that were used to work out some equations. And you don't have to worry too much about the uh, choice of the gauge in a sense that you can think uh, uh, of the gauge as, um, as the choice of a specific uh, uh, coordinate system and you can choose a different gauge or a different coordinate system that can be uh, that can simplify your calculations or that can simplify your pro your problem if the problem is written in that specific uh, um, choice of coordinates. Uh, so you can switch from one gauge to the other using the uh, usual coordinate transformation, of course, in the context of uh, general relativity uh, in this case, but there is nothing uh, uh, deeper than this in choosing one gauge instead of the other, uh, depending on which problem you are uh, you are considering. For example, for many uh, Boltzmann for many codes that evolve the Boltzmann equations, uh, it is useful uh, to to use the synchronous gauge uh, because it doesn't perturb the the uh, the time uh, part of the of the metric, uh, but uh, in some other problems, for example, when you deal with uh, inflation, a different choice of the gauge might, might be much more um, useful or simple than the synchronous or the Newtonian gauge. Uh, there was also another question about the um, physical motivation behind the uh, vector modes uh, decaying quickly after being generated. Uh, and apart from uh, formally um, seeing this decay by solving the, uh, the Einstein equation, one simple way in which you can understand why vector modes, if generated, uh, decay uh, is the following. So vector modes are basically uh, vorticity modes that are generated into the metric and then propagate to the other uh, components. And so, um, if you want to uh, conserve the, uh, the angular momentum as the universe expands, uh, the only way in which, uh, by writing down the angular momentum uh, uh, as a function of these uh, vorticity modes, uh, is, is to assume that the vorticity modes decay as the inverse of the scale factor in order to preserve the angular momentum. So the reason why they decay uh, quickly after being generated is uh, physically rooted in the fact that you want to uh, preserve the, uh, the angular momentum during the expansion of the universe. Um, I think that that's it for uh, the lecture of yesterday. Uh, before moving to uh, the second lecture today, I'd like to spend a few words on the last part uh, of the lecture that we could not cover yesterday, which is um, some basic picture of, uh, of inflation, uh, basically the, the origin of the perturbations that we will discuss at length uh, today. So today we will cover the evolution of uh, uh, matter perturbation and of uh, CMB anisotropies. But before doing that, uh, we would like to understand uh, uh, how these perturbations were put uh, in, in the universe and what is the paradigm that describes uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge today, the, the origin of this perturbation. This paradigm is provided by inflation, uh, which um, it comes with uh, um, nice solutions also to uh, 
uh, historical shortcomings uh, of the standard cosmological models. And these uh, historical shortcomings, you might have heard many times about that, are related to the so-called horizon problems, a problem, flatness problem, uh, ex um, extremely high smoothness uh, of the universe. And they can all be recasted in terms of the following. Uh, even if we observe uh, uh, perturbations and fluctuations uh, in, uh, in the component of the universe, these um, fluctuations are very small when compared uh, to uh, the background uh, value of, this, uh, of these quantities. You may think, for example, we will see in a while that the anisotropies in the CMB are at the level of 10 to the minus 5 uh, if compared to the uh, average value of the CMB temperature. Uh, now, if we evolve back uh, the expansion of the universe uh, um, and consider in the standard cosmological model, so without uh, uh, inflation, uh, what was the size uh, of the uh, horizon at early times? Um, this was extremely small if evolved back uh, in the standard BBN, in the standard Big Bang uh, uh, model. Why this is problematic? Uh, this is problematic because only um, particles or species that are inside uh, the causal horizon can interact with each other and therefore can uh, um, undergo those conditions that can equilibrate uh, uh, their, uh, um, their properties, their density, their velocity and, and so on. So only if we are inside the causal horizon, we can have those conditions that allow for uh, the extreme uh, smoothness that we observe uh, in, uh, in the universe at large scales uh, uh, today. Of course, it might be possible that even outside the horizon, there might be some processes that allow for uh, this smoothness, but it's uh, a bit counterintuitive to uh, assume that there are some processes that can equilibrate uh, the, um, the properties of the uh, content of the universe at the level, at the extremely high level that we observe today. Um, the, uh, the exit to this problem is provided by the inflationary paradigm, which basically says that uh, before the, uh, the Big Bang, so before the epoch of radiation domination, there was an epoch uh, of uh, exponential expansion of the universe, so during which uh, the expansion rate was constant, uh, that uh, allowed for the smoothness that we observe today. Um, this condition was realized by the fact that at that time the universe was dominated by a species uh, that we can call uh, the, uh, the inflaton uh, that had uh, a specific uh, uh, equation of state, the one that you uh, see here where the um, equation of state is w equal to minus one. And if we insert, uh, um, and on top of this, sorry, the, uh, the energy of this, um, uh, of this component was dominated by the uh, potential energy rather than the kinetic energy. So if we uh, write down the Friedman equation for a species uh, uh, which is dominated by the, uh, the potential, and the potential is also slowly varying at the time of inflation, then we end up with uh, the second line of this um, set of equations where uh, the uh, expansion rate of the universe uh, is almost constant uh, during the time of inflation. And if we solve for the scale factor, this remember that the Friedman equation is basically a differential equation for the scale factor. If we solve the, uh, this differential equation for the scale factor, then we end up with the scale factor evolving uh, um, exponentially during the time of inflation while H, uh, which uh, represent also the size uh, of the causal horizon at that time, remained constant. So we have a constant size of the causal horizon while the expansion, um, while the scale factor was evolving exponentially. This basically means that um, everything started inside the same causal horizon, but because of this exponential expansion, everything was stretched out uh, from, the, um, from the causal horizon. So everything that 
uh, at early times was inside the causal horizon at the time and the possibility to uh, reach the level of smoothness that we observe today but during the inflation was uh, stretched out the, um, the horizon before um, coming back inside the horizon during the expansion of the universe and this picture is summarized uh, here in this uh, in this plot where we have on the x-axis, the, um, the scale factor that goes from uh, left uh, early times uh, to right late times. And on the y-axis, we have uh, uh, the, uh, some, some length, uh, some important length uh, represented as a function of the scale factor. So if we focus on this um, rightmost part of the, of the picture, uh, this represents the evolution of the universe in case of uh, no inflation. So we start from uh, here, from this time, and we have the uh, causal horizon H, which is evolving according to the Friedman equation, so uh, with a power law during radiation domination, and after uh, the epoch of matter radiation equality, this power law is broken in another power law due to the fact that we have another component which is dominating uh, at that time. In this standard picture, where we start from radiation domination, each scale is uh, outside the horizon at early times. And for example, um, this is the scale that represents the size of the galaxy today, and this is the scale that represents instead the, um, the size of the horizon uh, today. So you see that um, at early times, uh, these scales are much larger than the horizon, and after uh, some time, uh, they become smaller than the horizon, so they enter inside the horizon, and at that time, uh, microphysics can start uh, um, operating uh, uh, on, on the components that are inside the horizon. This is problematic for the reasons that we have seen uh, before, but this is solved if we instead assume that before this radiation domination, there was an inflationary epoch where the uh, size of the horizon was constant during inflation. And so each scale, in this case, at very early times uh, during inflation, started inside the horizon. Then, because the horizon was, was constant, but the scale uh, uh, was evolving with the scale factor, uh, it exited the horizon at some point, which depends, of course, on the size of the scale. So, spends some time outside the horizon and then enters back uh, inside the horizon at a given time uh, during the standard evolution of the universe. And this allows to solve all the shortcomings that we have, uh, that we have discussed uh, uh, before, because we have a time where we were inside the horizon and therefore we could uh, uh, equilibrate uh, the, the situation as we observe today. Um, the other important prediction of, uh, of inflation is the generation of uh, uh, the, uh, the seeds uh, of the perturbations that we observe today, both in matter and in, um, in the CMD. These seeds were provided by uh, quantum fluctuation in the, inflaton, uh, in the inflaton fields that inflation then um, converted into perturbations to the metric and therefore into perturbations to uh, the uh, to the components uh, uh, of the universe uh, after, after inflation and after uh, entering back inside the, uh, the horizon. Um, perturbations to the inflaton fields uh, give rise to um, scalar perturbations to, uh, to trick and therefore scalar perturbations in the other components of the universe. But on top of this, uh, inflation also comes with the prediction that tensor perturbations uh, are applied to the metric. And so a uh, key prediction of inflation uh, or some uh, specific models of inflation is that uh, we will have uh, uh, primordial gravitational waves so that are due to the fact that initially we have tensor perturbations applied to the metric due to the inflationary mechanism. In order to uh, work out uh, the, um, the value of the initial perturbations, or better, if you remember what we have said yesterday, the power spectrum uh, of, the, um, of, of the initial perturbations, both scalar and tensor, that we have at early times, so we have to solve uh, the evolution equations for, uh, uh, for both scalar and tensor uh, fluctuations. 
they of course uh, require to quantize uh, the both the inflaton fields and also to uh, take into account the evolution of the tensor perturbations to the metric so after some algebra you can come out with these two equations for the evolution of scalar perturbations uh, on the left and tensor perturbations on the right remember that Tensor perturbations can be expressed in terms of these two functions, h cross and, um, uh, and h times, uh, uh, that represent the entries uh, of the um, um, traceless and symmetric tensor. Uh, the solution to this equation gives the value of the perturbations to the inflaton field and to uh, the tensorial part uh, of the matrix. Of the matrix. Uh, we have uh, uh, the value of the perturbations uh, uh, that are generated by inflation. In order to uh, relate uh, um, the, uh, the value of these perturbations to the perturbations that we observe today in matter and anisotropies and also in the metric, uh, we need some, uh, uh, some tool that allows to connect uh, the, uh, the conditions that we have during inflation to the conditions that we observe today once all the scales of interest have entered again uh, the horizon. And here comes uh, um, the um, um, the importance uh, of the um, of the gauge in a sense that the usual trick is to identify one quantity uh, a given quantity that uh, is invariant under uh, gauge transformations so one quantity that remains uh, the same depending on uh, regardless uh, from the choice of the gauge and this quantity uh, is the um, uh, the curvature perturbation, uh, uh, the curvature perturbation R. Um, this quantity is important because if we uh, write it uh, explicitly, uh, we can see that it remains constant uh, outside the horizon. So we write the value of this uh, uh, of this quantity, the curvature perturbation, uh, at the time of inflation. We, uh, we observe that this quantity is preserved uh, even if we go outside the horizon uh, at some point. And since it remains constant outside the horizon, uh, we can also write its value at the time of uh, the second horizon crossing, when the given scale is entering back uh, inside the horizon during the standard evolution of the universe. So the trick is to equate the value of this, con uh, of this, um, of this quantity once uh, the, the scale exit the horizon because of inflation to the value that it has uh, once it enters back the horizon uh, after inflation during the standard evolution of the universe. And this allows to connect uh, the perturbations that we have generated because of inflation to the perturbations to density metric and uh, um, and CND anisotropies that we um, that we observe uh, during the standard evolution of the universe. Another key prediction of inflation is that uh, the um, inflationary fluctuations uh, are Gaussian distributed, uh, and this means again, if you remember what we have discussed um, yesterday, that we are not really interested in the individual values of the uh, inflationary perturbations, but rather we are interested in uh, the um, statistical properties uh, of the field. And since the field is Gaussian distributed, we are only interested in uh, the, the first two moments of the distribution. The average value, which we take to be vanishing because we are dealing with perturbations, and the variance of the uh, distribution, which is represented by the the power spectrum uh, of the perturbations, both scalar and tensor. Uh, the power spectrum is defined here. Here I, I've written down the power spectrum of the uh, curvature uh, perturbation. Uh, and uh, the expression on the right um, is, uh, uh, is due to the fact that we are assuming uh, um, average, average uh, isotropic uh, and, um, um, and homogeneous universe in linear perturbation theory. So basically the delta function on the right 
is telling us that uh, the different Fourier modes can be treated independently from each other, so there is no mixing between different Fourier modes. And the power spectrum is depending only on the magnitude of the uh, of the Fourier of the wave number of the Fourier wave number, which is a consequence of the fact that the universe is um, uh, on average uh, isotropic, and so there is no dependency on the uh, direction of the uh, of the Fourier mode. And a similar expression can also be uh, written down for the uh, tensor power spectrum. Um, it is um, common to um, refer not to the power spectrum itself, P of K, but to the contribution of the power spectrum per logarithmic bin. Uh, so this would be represented by the power spectrum multiplied uh, uh, by the uh, wave number to the three. Uh, and so the, um, uh, the, the usual reference is to these uh, dimensionless uh, power spectrum, uh, which is which represents the contribution of uh, not only uh, the inflationary power spectra, but of any power spectrum to logarithmic bin uh, in um, uh, in K. A key prediction of inflation is that this dimensionless power spectrum uh, is scale invariant. So the uh, dependency on the scale uh, carried by the power spectrum uh, P of K times uh, the k to the cube dependency that comes from uh, this expression for the dimension and spectrum uh, is almost uh, uh, independent uh, of k. Um, originally, uh, the, um, the original prediction was that uh, uh, there was no dependence at all, so that this uh, dimensionless power spectrum was basically constant uh, as a function of the uh, wave number, and that was called the Harrison Zeldovich uh, spectrum. But today, from observations, we observe uh, um, uh, deviations from this uh, truly scale independent, a small deviation, but still an important deviation from this truly scale independent power spectrum. Nevertheless, this deviation is, um, uh, is, very, uh, is very small, and this is a key prediction of, uh, of inflation. The parameters that we can use to um, express uh, the uh, power spectra, both for scalar and tensor perturbations, are um, phenomenological parameters, but they can be uh, related to physical properties uh, of the inflationary field and of the uh, metric at, uh, um, at early times during inflation. In particular, they can be related to the amplitude and shape of the uh, potential uh, of the inflaton field. Therefore, if we are able to constrain uh, with the cosmological observations uh, the parameters that describe these initial power spectra, we also are able to uh, constrain the physical properties uh, of, the, um, of the inflationary stages. Uh, this is the uh, explicit expression of the, uh, the scalar uh, dimensionless scalar uh, power spectrum on the left. Uh, where we have an amplitude uh, AS of um, an overall amplitude of the spectrum uh, normalized to a given uh, to a given scale, which is usually referred to as the uh, pivot, uh, and NS is the uh, scalar spectral index. So it's the spectral index of the um, uh, of the spectrum of scalar perturbations that tell us uh, what is this slope uh, of the uh, power spectrum for scalar perturbations. And the same can be done for the tensor power spectrum on the right, uh, where we have an amplitude, this time for tensor perturbations, and um, uh, tensor uh, spectral index uh, NT. And both uh, the amplitudes and the spectral indices can be um, related to the physical properties of, uh, of inflation. Uh, an important parameter is the ratio between the amplitude of tensor perturbations to uh, the amplitude of scalar perturbations, which is referred to uh, the tensor to scalar ratio R. Uh, and its, important, uh, its importance is related to the fact that since we can constrain uh, the amplitude of scalar per perturbations very well um, with cosmological observations, if we were able to constrain the uh, tensor to scalar ratio as well, we would have uh, an important handle to the energy scale of inflation. 
because R is proportional to the amplitude of tensor perturbations, which in turn are proportional to, um, the, um, uh, to, the, to the energy density uh, that is entering into uh, the, the Friedman equation. And the energy density at the time of inflation is basically given by the inflationary potential. So a constraint on R can be translated into a constraint on the scale, uh, on the energy scale of inflation. And this is the reason why uh, today there is uh, uh, such a um, huge effort uh, to uh, have dedicated observations of the uh, tensor modes in order to constrain the scalar spectral index. Finally, um, another important um, prediction of, uh, of inflation, especially of the simplest uh, uh, models of inflation, is the uh, kind of initial perturbations that are uh, um, uh, generated uh, in the early universe. Uh, in the simple model of inflation, where inflation is driven by uh, one component, uh, which is the, the inflaton, we can think of the uh, perturbations uh, in, uh, in the field uh, as if they were uh, basically the same average value of the field, but computed at different times, uh, where the different times differ from each other for very tiny uh, time shifts. Uh, and this is the, uh, the meaning of the first equation that you see uh, on the slide. So if, uh, if this is true, if these perturbations can be thought uh, as originating from time shift uh, perturbation, then from the first equation in the slide, we can derive uh, the second equation that relates uh, uh, the um, density perturbations in each of the different components of the universe and their uh, corresponding equation of state. So this is basically telling that uh, the, uh, there is a perfectly clear relation between the different uh, perturbations in the different components uh, of the universe and therefore once we have specified one of these uh, um, one of the uh, perturbations in one of these components that we can derive all the others from uh, this relation that is said uh, to come from adiabatic initial conditions and this represents the set of initial conditions that we have to apply to the Boltzmann equations so when we evolve uh, the, uh, the perturbations in the different components of the universe. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we have many different models of inflation and some of these models can be very complicated and in uh, more complicated models uh, of inflation, uh, the um, initial conditions that are put on the uh, perturbations to the universe component can be different from the adi adiabatic initial conditions. In particular, when the second equation in this slide is not uh, um, satisfied anymore, we call, uh, we talk about isocurvature um, initial conditions. Uh, and um, for example, this can happen when we have more than one field uh, that is uh, dominating or that is important during uh, the, uh, the inflationary stage. Current observations are in, uh, we will see um, later this afternoon, that current observations uh, are in agreement with adiabatic initial conditions uh, and the constraints that are put on the amount of uh, uh, isocurvature perturbations are very tight. So there is no evidence for deviations from the uh, most simple uh, description of the inflationary stages. Okay. Um, I'd like to move to the uh, second lecture now, but before doing that, I'd like to ask if we have questions from uh, from people. Questions for Martina? Okay, there is one. Could you please repeat how one could measure, can measure, sorry, the, para mm -hmm. the parameter R mentioned in a slide 34, I think that he is referring, Andrei Romanov, is referring to mm -hmm. the scalar sure. ratio. Um, yeah, we will see it better uh, this afternoon, but uh, uh, the, uh, the key route towards uh, measurements of, uh, of R is measuring the um, one kind of uh, polarization in the cosmic microwave background. We will see that one, uh, the CMB is polarized, 
uh, and two, that one of the uh, components of this polarization field uh, in, the CMB, um, in the CMB field can only be sourced uh, by tensor perturbations to, um, to the metric. Uh, and the amplitude of this uh, uh, so-called B-mode polarization pattern in the CMB uh, is uh, proportional to this uh, tensor to scalar ratio parameter. And therefore, if we are able to uh, measure the amplitude of the uh, B-mode polarization field in, um, in the CMB, uh, we also have a way to constrain the tensor to scalar ratio and, and to measure this important parameter. There are several CMB experiments that have, uh, um, uh, that have done that. Uh, currently, we don't have uh, measurements of R. We only have upper bounds. So we can only say that R is smaller than some very low value. Uh, so we are going to lower this threshold more and more. And the hope is that uh, in the next decade or in the next uh, years, uh, we will have uh, the um, required sensitivity uh, to get uh, uh, either to get a measurement of this important parameter or to uh, exclude even more uh, uh, values of this parameter that in turn, uh, if we think to the physics uh, that is related to this parameter, will allow us to exclude uh, a bunch of different models uh, of inflation that uh, predict a uh, high value of the tensor to scalar ratio. But we will see it better uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much, Martina. So I don't see more questions, but I um, mean, no, no raise hands. So no. So if you want to go ahead? I mean, we. We'll... Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Martina. Sure. Thanks to you. And remember that that you can always come to Gather Town and and ask questions offline if you if you prefer to. Um, so now let's start uh, uh, with uh, the uh, evolution of these perturbations. We have seen in, in the previous lecture what are the tools that we need to uh, describe the evolution of perturbations. We have just seen what is the mechanism that we believe has seeded uh, these perturbations. And now we would like to um, see uh, concretely how these perturbations evolved uh, in the early universe. And uh, we will start with the evolution of perturbations to the matter field. Uh, before starting, uh, uh, let's have a, a qualitative uh, argument here. Uh, we observe fluctuations uh, in the CMB field. I have already uh, said that these perturbations are very, very tiny uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 5, uh, and they are even smaller in, uh, in polarization. Since uh, we have just seen that uh, there is a, a connection between the perturbations in one component to the perturbation in another component due to uh, the uh, type of initial conditions that are set by inflation, uh, we can say that the amount of fluctuations that we observe in the CMB is proportional to the amount of perturbations that we expect in the matter field. Uh, at the time of uh, um, recombination, uh, this which is uh, the picture that is provided by the CMB, the CMB is giving us a, a sort of snapshot of the universe as it was at the time of recombination. We will see why. Uh, we will see why in, in, in a while. So at the time of recombination, this means that the perturbations in the matter field were um, very tiny. But today we observe very large, uh, uh, not just perturbations, but very large over densities or under densities in the matter field. We observe galaxies, clusters of galaxies. We observe uh, ginormous voids um, in the universe. So we need a mechanism that is able to tell us how these tiny perturbations in the matter field evolved in such a way to generate the very rich and very structured uh, cosmic web that we observe uh, uh, that we observe today. This mechanism is provided by the uh, gravitational instability mechanism, or so-called Jinx mechanism. And this might be familiar to some of you who have um, uh, done, for example, uh, star formation in, um, um, in clouds, or that have studied uh, the uh, dynamical equilibrium of, uh, of stars. 
the idea is that basically uh, the um, uh, the growth of these perturbations in matter uh, was uh, um, uh, due to the fact that gravity took over uh, the uh, pressure uh, balance that was provided uh, at the time of uh, radiation domination. Uh, so these perturbations under the effect of uh, gravitational collapse uh, uh, grew uh, uh, more and more during the time of, uh, of matter domination until they reached the level that we observe uh, uh, today. This is um, uh, a, a summary of the, um, of the quantity that we will discuss uh, in, um, in this part of, uh, of the lecture. I will refer uh, to a scale, uh, sometimes in terms of the um, length uh, of the scale, but also in terms of the wave number. And we know that there is a very precise relation between the, uh, the wavelength and the wave number uh, of a given scale. Remember that uh, K um, can be uh, considered both as the co-moving uh, uh, scale, and if we want the co-moving wave number, we need to divide the, uh, sorry, the physical wave number, we have to divide the co-moving wave number uh, by the, uh, the scale factor. And this comes from the fact that, of course, the physical length is proportional to the co-moving length times uh, the, uh, the scale factor. I will also refer to uh, the um, uh, power spectrum uh, at uh, horizon crossing uh, in terms, of both in terms of the uh, dimensionless power spectrum. So again, uh, the uh, the actual power spectrum that we can express uh, as a power of the wave number. This is remember this is a, the prediction of uh, of inflation times uh, the uh, k to the cube that is needed in order to express the dimensionless uh, power spectrum, the contribution to logarithmic bin. So if I want to um, uh, to understand what is the, um, the shape of the uh, primordial power, st power spectrum, the dimensional power spectrum uh, at the time of horizon crossing, what I have to do is to divide the uh, dimensionless power spectrum times the wave number uh, to the three. Uh, the, key, um, the, the key topic here is that um, we have seen that inflation predicts uh, uh, some scale to be inside the horizon at early times, uh, exit the horizon uh, at, uh, at the time of inflation. Uh, the spectrum of the primordial perturbations is frozen as these modes exit the horizon because there is a quantity that remains uh, constant at that time. So the spectrum that enters inside the horizon is the same spectrum that left the horizon at the time of, um, uh, of inflation. Once this spectrum or these scales enter back uh, the horizon during the, um, uh, the standard evolution of the universe, then microphysics can start uh, modifying uh, this, uh, this spectrum with respect to the uh, initial conditions. And uh, this will lead us to uh, the matter power spectrum that we observe uh, uh, today. So the key point here is that once the spectrum enters the horizon the second time, uh, during the standard uh, uh, evolution, then the spectrum is transformed, is modified uh, in such a way that is due to uh, microphysical effects. Uh, let's describe a bit more in detail what these microphysical effects uh, are. And before moving to uh, the description in an expanding universe, it's useful to have a um, qualitative description of the uh, genes mechanism in a non-expanding universe. Uh, in this case, uh, the um, evolution of a perfect fluid, remember that matter can be described as a perfect fluid, we just need the uh, evolution of density uh, and, and velocity because uh, matter has, uh, is a um, collisionless um, species. So uh, in this case, we can write down the standard set of, uh, of equations that describe the evolution of a perfect fluid. We only need the evolution of uh, density, the evolution of velocity times uh, uh, the Poisson equation uh, that describes how the, um, the potential uh, in, in the metric is modified by the uh, density, energy density uh, in, um, in the component. From this set of equations, um, 
this set of equations can be uh, linearized. Remember that uh, perturbation theory is based on the uh, linear expansion as long as the perturbations as, are smaller with respect to the average value of the uh, components we can uh, just retain uh, first order in the linearized uh, uh, equation uh, once we have done that we can uh, combine these three equations together in uh, uh, one second order differential equation that describes the evolution that describes the evolution of the uh, perturbation uh, to uh, to density and in this equation here that is uh, i hope that you can see my my mouse in this equation the second order differential equation uh, this vs term here is the sound speed which is defined as the um, um, as the ratio between pressure and, uh, and density in this uh, specific case. The solution to this equation is, uh, is very simple. You might have recognized uh, a kind of uh, um, wave uh, solution that can be written in this way here. Remember that rho one is the perturbation to, uh, to the density, so we can rewrite it as a small perturbation delta on top of the average perturbation uh, on the average value rho zero. And uh, the exponential expression that we observe here is the formal solution to the second order differential equation. Now, this solution can have two different qualitative uh, um, behaviors depending on uh, the, um, the sign of the relation depends on the um, balance between these two terms so one term that depends on the sound speed and another terms that depends instead on the effect of uh, uh, of gravitation on the gravitational constant we can recast the dispersion relation in uh, in this way introducing kj which is the so-called genes uh, uh, wave number so in this way it is very easy to see that uh, if we consider modes uh, or wave numbers that are larger than uh, the genes wave number then uh, the uh, dispersion relation gives uh, a real number and therefore if we plug a real number here we have a um, solution that resemble acoustic waves so we have oscillations in this uh, in this fluid due to the fact that uh, uh, gravity the gravitational collapse is counterbalanced by the uh, radiation pressure uh, that is uh, that is provided uh, into the um, into the fluid and this is the same mechanism that regulates basically the equilibrium um, uh, stage of a um, of a star but instead, if we consider wave numbers or scales that are smaller than the gene scale, then uh, the dispersion relation has an um, uh, imaginary solution. And if we plug this imaginary solution into the formal equation uh, above, then the picture is completely different. We don't have any more um, uh, an, acoustic, uh, an acoustic wave, but instead we have a, um, a growing mode um, that, uh, um, that is due to the fact that in this case, for wave numbers that are smaller than uh, the genes wave number, gravity is taking over uh, pressure and therefore the gravitational collapse cannot be uh, counterbalanced, uh, uh, counterbalanced anymore. Uh, the, um, the critical wave number is therefore the, uh, the genes uh, wave number. Uh, and this is uh, um, comparing a given scale or a given wave number to uh, the genes scale or the genes wave number is basically telling us what is the threshold for um, balance between uh, uh, gravitational collapse and pressure and instead uh, when gravitational collapse start to dominate over pressure and therefore the uh, growth uh, of these perturbations is uh, uh, is really starting and we can think of this comparison as the comparison between the uh, typical uh, time scale for uh, uh, pressure balance which is given by uh, the the sound speed and the and the typical time scale for gravitational collapse which instead is given by uh, the inverse of the um, of the gravitational constant so when we compare the different scales against the genes wave number what we are um, roughly doing is comparing 
necessary for these two uh, mechanisms uh, to, um, to balance uh, with each other. This provides uh, a very clear uh, and qualitative description of what the genes mechanism is, but now we have to integrate this qualitative picture with uh, the expansion of the universe. So the equation, uh, the second order differential equation that we have written before must be complemented with uh, this additional second term here, which depends on the first derivative of the um, density perturbation and is, um, is telling us what the effect of the expansion is on, this, uh, on the evolution of perturbation. This is called the Hubble friction term uh, and is telling us how the expansion is modifying uh, the growth uh, of structure uh, with, uh, within this genes mechanism. The formal, um, again, we can, of course, define uh, um, uh, genes with number also in this case, simply uh, by rewriting the terms that appear in, uh, in square bracket. And in this case, uh, since we are in an expanding universe, of course, we have to take into account the scale factor. And the expression that we see here in this slide, at the center of this slide, represent the co-moving expression for uh, the um, for the genes uh, uh, wave number. If we uh, work out the formal solution to uh, the second order equation in the case of an expanding universe, um, the uh, qualitative description is more or less the same in a sense that for wave numbers that are uh, larger than the genes wave number, uh, we um, have a balance between um, gravitational collapse and pressure uh, and instead if we are considering scales that are um, wave numbers that are smaller than uh, than the genes wave number or equivalently scales uh, that are larger than the genes scale uh, the gravitational collapse takes over however uh, quantitatively the situation is different because uh, when we have acoustic waves uh, due to the expansion of the universe the amplitude of these acoustic waves uh, is slowly decreasing but once we enter into the regime of uh, uh, domination of gravitational collapse, we don't have an exponential growth uh, anymore as we had uh, in absence of expansion. But the expansion is uh, um, inhibiting the growth of perturbations in such a way that the growing mode in this case is not exponential anymore, but instead uh, follows a power law, um, uh, power law evolution. So the expansion is basically uh, slowing down the growth of this perturbation with respect to the case of uh, no um, expansion uh, uh, at all. Another uh, addition that we have to make to this picture is the fact that in some cases, uh, while in some cases we can write down uh, the um, evolution equation just for one component, because for example, we are deep in the matter domination regime or um, we can neglect uh, other components in the universe, there are some stages or some cases in which it is important to take into account the fact that uh, even if we are following the evolution of one component, say, for example, we want to know how perturbations in the matter, cold dark matter component evolve, uh, we also need to take into account the effect, direct or indirect, so-called back reactions, that the other components that are present at the same time might have uh, on, this, um, uh, on this evolution. Uh, one way of doing that is, of course, to include uh, their contribution as the uh, sum of the different perturbations in the Poissonian term. But another way to include the contribution of this additional component if, is, of course, the modification of the evolution of the scale factor. Because when we write down uh, this equation must be coupled to the Friedman equation in order to uh, have uh, the uh, evolution of the scale factor that we need to plug in here. So in the Friedman equation, we must take into account all the different components uh, that are um, uh, contributing to the expansion of the universe at that time. So even if we can neglect in some cases uh, some of the components here in the Poisson term, we cannot neglect them in some other cases in the Hubble uh, friction term. And we will see what the effect of these terms uh, here. For example, uh, in the case of cold dark matter, uh, deep in the radiation domination uh, uh, epoch, 
the dominant component in this case, in the Poissonian term, is the, uh, radiation, uh, is the radiation component. Uh, the formal solution, if we uh, consider just radiation and neglect uh, all the other components, uh, is not a power law evolution, but instead is a logarithm logarithmic evolution of the perturbations of uh, uh, cold dark matter. This means that in uh, uh, deep in the radiation domination epoch, the growth of matter perturbations is inhibited because of the fact that uh, radiation is um, um, dominating over the other components and therefore is driving the expansion much more uh, quicker than it is done during matter domination. Remember that the scaling uh, of the scale factor during uh, radiation domination is different with respect to the scaling uh, in matter domination. So during radiation domination, we have a stagnation of the uh, matter perturbations that can start uh, really to grow uh, after the epoch of matter radiation uh, equality. Uh, this slide uh, is providing a summary of uh, uh, what happens to the evolution of uh, uh, matter perturbations, both in cold dark matter and in uh, ordinary matter or, uh, or baryons, depending on uh, uh, the um, comparison between a given uh, scale or a given wave number with respect to the uh, to the genes scale. In the case of uh, uh, cold dark matter, uh, the genes scale, which is uh, the genes wave number, which uh, remember is given by the um, ratio between the gravitational term times the uh, the energy density divided by uh, the uh, acoustic um, um, the acoustic speed uh, is very large is very large because the acoustic speed uh, uh, of a cold dark matter component is uh, um, is vanishing with zero and therefore the genes wave number is um, uh, is very large this means that uh, the gene scale is much larger than any uh, scale of the perturbations in cold dark matter. And therefore, once cold dark matter perturbations enter the horizon, they are always smaller than uh, the gene scale for cold dark, cold dark matter. And therefore, cold dark matter perturbations can start to grow as soon as they enter the horizon, either logarithmically during radiation domination or uh, um, with a power law during matter domination. And you can see it here in this plot uh, on the bottom, where we have on the x-axis the um, scale factor uh, growing from left early times to right late times. And on the y-axis, we have the evolution of perturbations in cold dark matter, which here is historically uh, labeled as WIMP and baryons. Focusing on WIMPs, we see that before the epoch of matter radiation equality here, uh, the perturbations are very slowly uh, evolving as the logarithm of the, uh, of the scale factor. But once we enter in the epoch of matter radiation equality, then we start evolving uh, uh, as um, proportional to the scale factor, so as a power law uh, in the scale factor. The situation in the baryon fluid is slightly different. The gene scale is again given by the ratio between the gravitational term and the uh, acoustic speed. But in this case, we have to distinguish between uh, two different epochs. Remember that baryons are uh, tightly coupled to, uh, to radiation until the time of uh, recombination. And recombination happens after the epoch of matter radiation equality. So the, uh, the gene scale um, is, um, uh, is almost the size of the acoustic horizon um, during uh, the time of tight coupling between baryons uh, and, uh, and radiation. This is because the acoustic speed in the case of tight coupling is basically given by the acoustic speed of, uh, uh, of radiation, which is equal to, uh, to one third. So in, um, before recombination in the epoch of tight coupling, the gene scale is uh, of the order of the acoustic horizon, the, the distance that can, can travel than acoustic waves, and it is smaller than the uh, causal horizon. So in this epoch, uh, once a perturbation enters the causal horizon, 
if it is uh, still larger than the genes, uh, um, uh, the genes wave number, then we have acoustic oscillations uh, in the uh, in the baryon fluid because of the fact that we are larger than the gene scale and therefore uh, pressure can counterbalance gravitational collapse. Uh, once uh, baryons decouple from uh, uh, from radiation, so after uh, well, well after recombination, uh, the acoustic speed in the baryon fluid is basically given by the acoustic speed of a non-relativistic species, so similar to cold dark matter. So the genes wave number goes to very large values as it was for cold dark matter. And at that time, uh, any given scale was uh, um, smaller than the gene scale, and therefore baryon can start collapsing inside the uh, gravitational wells that have been produced by the cold dark matter collapse. It said that baryons at that time can catch up uh, with the evolution of cold dark matter. And this is very clear in the picture. If we now follow the uh, curve for uh, the baryon uh, uh, evolution, we see that baryons basically do not grow until the time of uh, matter radiation uh, decoupling. And at this point, uh, when uh, the baryon are free from the pressure support uh, of radiation, they can start growing uh, dramatically until they finally catch up with the evolution of the perturbations in the cold dark matter fluid. Another important uh, scale that we have to take uh, uh, into account uh, is the uh, is the free streaming scale. Uh, the free streaming scale applies to um, species uh, that um, that have a very large uh, velocity dispersion uh, after they uh, decouple from the rest of uh, uh, of the components of the universe. And this will be very important, as you will see, uh, for um, uh, for neutrinos. The very large thermal velocity of uh, of these species means that. Uh, they can um, stream out uh, of over dense region, but they can also stream in uh, under dense region. And this means that um, they can very efficiently uh, eliminate any perturbations uh, um, that uh, that can be compared with uh, uh, with the free streaming uh, with the free streaming scale. Similarly to what we have done with uh, the gene scale, we can represent the free streaming scale as the balance between two uh, different uh, uh, between two different effects. One that is uh, um, again given by the uh, the scale factor, and the other effect is given by the velocity dispersion of these um, uh, of these particles of these components. This velocity dispersion can be as large as the uh, speed of light for massless particles or for particles for massive particles that are still in their in their ultra relativistic regime. Uh, but it can be uh, very small and comparable with uh, uh, the average momentum of this particle divided by their mass. In the case of massive particles that are uh, already in the non relativistic regime. So, uh, massless species uh, have a free streaming uh, uh, wave number or a free streaming scale that is comparable with uh, the causal horizon. This means that for massless particles, uh, all the perturbations that are uh, inside the horizon are completely erased by uh, this free streaming behavior uh, of the um, uh, of, uh, of massless particle. Basically, because the very large thermal velocity allows uh, this particle to uh, escape from the uh, gravitational attraction of the forming structures in the universe. However, as soon as these particles become non-relativistic, uh, the free streaming scale becomes smaller than the horizon. And at that point, we can distinguish between two different uh, regimes. Uh, for these kind of particles, uh, if uh, we have a perturbation that is uh, uh, larger than uh, the, free streaming, um, uh, the free streaming scale, uh, in this case, uh, um, gravitational collapse cannot be uh, counteracted anymore by the large thermal velocities, and therefore uh, this component uh, also contributes to the uh, clustering uh, of the large scale structures. Instead, on scales that are smaller than the free streaming scale, so on wave numbers that are larger 
than the, um, uh, the, the free streaming wave number. Free streaming is still very efficient in erasing perturbations uh, and therefore these species do not contribute to clustering on scales that are smaller than the free streaming scales. Uh, this is the reason why uh, it is always said that hot dark matter, uh, which is a, a dark matter component that decouples when still ultra relativistic and has a very large thermal velocity, cannot be the dominant dark matter component today. Because uh, for hot dark matter, we cannot form a, a structure, cosmological structures on small scales, and therefore if the evolution of cosmological structures was dominated by a hot dark matter component, we will live in a universe where very large structures are much older than small structures. So very large structures formed uh, before, and by fragmentation of these very large structures, we can form uh, uh, smaller structures such as galaxies and so on. Instead, the observations are more in agreement uh, with a so-called uh, bottom-up uh, scenario of structure formations, where the small structures are much older and much more evolved, while uh, the largest structures, such as clusters or clusters of clusters, uh, are still uh, in a very early stages of their, uh, of their formation. And this kind of scenario cannot be accounted for if we assume that all the dark matter or a much larger fraction of dark matter uh, was in a form of a hot dark matter. Finally, uh, in order to complete the picture of structure formation, we need to understand what happens at very uh, late times when uh, the, uh, the universe is dominated by lambda, the cosmological constant or uh, dark energy. What happens at this point is that the Hubble friction term start to become uh, much more important than the other components in the evolution equation for, uh, for perturbations. Uh, remember that the uh, lambda domination means that the universe is, um, uh, is accelerating, so uh, we have a very large uh, uh, effect on the Hubble friction in the Boltzmann equation. And the net result is that the growth of perturbation because of, the, of this very large Hubble friction term is slow down, and slow down in a way that is independent from uh, the wave number. And the way we can take into account this uh, um, growth uh, uh, factor effect is by rewriting the evolution of perturbation uh, as it is expressed here at the center of the slide. Basically, uh, in the regime of lambda domination, the evolution of perturbation is not proportional to the scale factor anymore, but is corrected by this growth factor term here that depends only on the scale factor and on the amount of matter and uh, uh, cosmological constant or dark energy component that we have in the universe. This G function here, this growth function here, uh, is a decreasing uh, uh, function of the scale factor that goes from one, of course, during matter domination, because we have to recover uh, the evolution uh, that, that we have worked out in the case of matter domination, and is vanishingly small uh, as we approach uh, uh, later times or uh, uh, current times. Uh, this is very important and is key in order to investigate the properties of dark energy because if we are able to observe the evolution of cosmological structures at very late times and if we are able to do the so-called tomography uh, of these observations, so uh, having a picture of the universe at different uh, redshifts or different values of the scale factor at late times, we are able to capture the behavior of the uh, growth function, so the effect of dark energy on the evolution of cosmological structures, and therefore uh, we are able to uh, investigate in uh, more details uh, the properties of this very uh, mysterious component uh, of the universe. Um, everything that I've said uh, uh, so far uh, is related to the behavior of perturbations uh, inside the horizon. Remember that I always say that once these perturbations enter the horizon, blah, blah, blah. This picture must be completed with uh, what happens to the perturbations when they are uh, uh, super horizon. We already know that uh, uh, if we are outside the causal horizon, so if we are super horizon, um, 
microphysics, uh, so all the uh, effect of interactions between the components and all the things that we have seen so far uh, are not important. And the only important thing uh, is the uh, expansion of the universe. This allows us to work out a very uh, simple description of how these perturbations evolve uh, outside uh, the, um, uh, the horizon, simply comparing uh, uh, what happens to uh, the evolution of two different universes that have slightly different values uh, of the uh, energy density. So let's consider two universes, one with an average density rho zero, and the second universe with an average density rho one, which can be, for example, a little bit larger than rho zero. The same can, can apply also if we consider rho one to be slightly smaller than rho zero. The important thing is that they are not too much different. So we can treat this difference as a small perturbation. So if rho one is, is a bit larger than rho zero, we can think of this second universe as a universe with uh, um, a positive curvature parameter, because on top of this, we want to impose that these two universes have the very same expansion rate. So the Friedman equation H um, that tells us uh, H in these two universes has to be the same. We want the expansion rate to be the same. Therefore, we equate the Friedman equations for these two universes and we obtain uh, the uh, equation, the first equation that we see on this slide uh, that we can uh, express in terms of this delta, which represents a small perturbation with respect to the first uh, universe with energy density rho zero. The ratio between this, the difference between the two energies uh, normalized uh, to uh, the energy density of the first universe that we can now think of as the average energy density in the universe is basically given by the ratio between the curvature uh, term that we have in the second universe because we have imposed the, the same expansion rate and the gravitational term that we have instead in the first uh, uh, universe. Since uh, we know how the uh, average density evolves uh, with the scale factor in the different epochs, uh, radiation domination and matter domination, it is easy to understand how this small perturbation delta evolves uh, as a function of the scale factor, simply writing down the evolution of rho in the two different epochs. And so it's easy to show that uh, uh, perturbations on uh, super horizon scales evolve uh, as the um, dominant component uh, at any specific epoch. So they evolve as the uh, square of the scale factor during radiation domination and as the uh, scale factor itself during uh, matter domination. This is the evolution outside the horizon. Once they enter the horizon, they are reprocessed by uh, microphysics uh, and therefore we can observe uh, uh, a different shape uh, of the power spectrum uh, with respect to the uh, original power spectrum. This is the uh, qualitative picture before we move to uh, discuss uh, uh, CMB in, uh, in a while. And after this picture, I will ask for questions. But for the moment, stay with me for uh, uh, one or two minutes while I try to uh, explain what we observe in this, uh, in this plot. This plot is showing the matter power spectrum on the uh, y-axis. This is the dimensional power spectrum. So it's not the, the power spectrum multiplied times k to the, to the cube. Remember the difference between the two. So on the y-axis, we have the dimensional power spectrum. On the x-axis, we have the uh, wave number k. Uh, and this Three different uh, uh, shapes are showing the power spectrum for uh, different combination of components. So the solid line is the total matter power spectrum. So the matter power spectrum that comes when we account for cold dark matter, baryons and neutrinos. The uh, shaded line uh, is the power spectrum for, for cold and baryonic dark matter. Uh, uh, sorry, for cold dark matter and for baryon matter. And the uh, dotted line instead is the power spectrum for uh, neutrinos. Why the power spectrum has this uh, uh, peculiar shape uh, with uh, a growing branch 
uh, at small wave numbers, a turning point uh, at a given uh, uh, wave number, and then a decreasing shape uh, at large uh, wave numbers. The reason is, is given by the different evolution of the uh, perturbations that we have discussed uh, uh, so far. I've told you that the uh, power spectrum at horizon crossing is uh, almost uh, scale invariant. Um, so it's, um, it's basically, uh, we, at, at first approximation, we can think of the uh, power spectrum at horizon crossing uh, as a constant uh, power spectrum. This is the dimensionless power spectrum. So if we want to compare this power spectrum here, to the power spectrum, uh, dimensional power spectrum at horizon crossing, uh, we need to divide uh, the um, uh, scale invariant uh, dimensionless power spectrum times uh, k to the minus 3 in order to retrieve the dimensional power spectrum. And since the dimensionless power spectrum is scale invariant, the dimensional power spectrum at horizon crossing scales uh, as k to the minus 3. The other ingredient that we know in order to understand this shape uh, is the um, scaling uh, of the wave number at horizon crossing as a function of the scale factor. And this can be found simply remembering that uh, the wave number at horizon crossing is basically equivalent to the scale of the causal horizon. So we can write down this expression and simply express the uh, Hubble parameter in terms of the scale factor. And so we have two different scalings depending on which epoch we are considering. And finally, uh, the last thing that we uh, need to understand is that sometimes uh, it is useful to express the matter power spectrum not uh, uh, at horizon crossing, so the different scales at horizon crossing, of course, uh, will enter the horizon at different times. So if we describe the power spectrum at horizon crossing, we are effectively describing the behavior of the different scales at different times. But sometimes we would like to know what is the total power spectrum at a given time. So instead of fixing uh, the, the scale, we would like to express the power spectrum as a function of the scale, fixing the time at which we want to compute the power spectrum. In order to do that, we need to understand how the power spectrum at horizon crossing is modified once it enters uh, uh, the horizon. Let's start uh, uh, assume, considering that um, an important epoch for the evolution of matter perturbations is the epoch of matter radiation equality. Why is that? Uh, that is because after matter radiation equality, all the scales uh, evolve uh, similarly to each other, evolve uh, as the uh, scale factor uh, itself. Remember that if we are in uh, radiation domination, the scales that are inside the horizon uh, are fr almost frozen. They evolve as the logarithm of the scale factor because of uh, radiation domination. But once we are deep in matter domination, then every scale evolves uh, as the scale factor itself. So this single out uh, a very specific scale, which is the scale that enters the horizon of the time of uh, uh, equality. And this is the scale that corresponds to the peak of the matter power spectrum. And we will see why in, uh, we will see why in one second. The reason is the following. Consider scales uh, that are uh, um, larger than the scale that enters the um, horizon at the time of uh, matter radiation equality. If they are, um, um, sorry, scales that are smaller than the scale that enters the horizon at matter radiation equality, so wave numbers that are larger than the wave number at matter radiation equality. These scales, of course, will enter the horizon much earlier than the scale at matter radiation equality because they are smaller. So they will be inside the horizon already at the time of matter radiation equality. If this happens, this means that by the time they enter the horizon until the time of matter radiation equality, they have grown as the logarithm uh, of, the, uh, of the scale factor. 
then we need to evolve uh, uh, this, uh, this spectrum until the given time that we want the matter power spectrum to be computed at. And so we have to add an additional grow as the, um, uh, as the scale factor until, say, the, the present time. So the, the final expression for the matter power spectrum today or at a given time is given by the power spectrum at random crossing times the, logarithm, the logarithmic growth uh, during radiation domination times uh, the um, growth as the scale factor during matter domination. Uh, if we plug in the expression in terms of the uh, wave number here for the different terms that we, uh, that we see in this expression, then we end up with the power spectrum today scaling as uh, k to the minus 3. And this gives uh, the shape of this uh, rightmost branch of the matter power spectrum. Now let's consider the leftmost part of the matter power spectrum. This corresponds to uh, wave numbers that are smaller than the wave number that enters the horizon of matter radiation equality. So these are scales that are uh, smaller than the um, that are larger, sorry, than the scales that enter the horizon of matter radiation equality. This means that these scales are still super horizon at the time of uh, uh, of matter radiation equality, and therefore that they will continue to grow as the um, as the scale factor, both while they are super horizon. Remember the behavior of super horizon scales, but also when they become sub horizon, because they will become sub horizon after matter radiation equality during matter domination. And so, if we write down the expression of the matter power spectrum as a function of the power spectrum at horizon crossing times uh, the uh, growth of the uh, perturbations at the, um, uh, from the time of uh, superhorizon uh, entering to a given time, then we end up with this expression in terms of the uh, wave number. So the power spectrum today on scales that are um, larger than the scale that entered the horizon at matter radiation equality scales uh, uh, linearly with the wave number. And this explains this behavior of the leftmost part of the matter power spectrum. Uh, in other words, uh, we are saying that the evolution of the matter power spectrum as a function of the wave number and time can be split uh, into two different contributions. The contribution that we have from uh, uh, primordial conditions that give us uh, the shape of the power spectrum at horizon crossing as a function of the wave number times uh, a so-called transfer function T that is telling us uh, how the primordial power spectrum at horizon crossing is modified by the evolution of the universe. And the dependency on time is entering into this transfer function here. Of course, the, tran the transfer function is different depending on which species we are considering because we have seen that cold dark matter, baryons and neutrinos evolve uh, differently due to their different properties because of tight coupling, because of free streaming. And therefore, we can explain why we have these uh, different shapes depending on which component we are, uh, um, we are observing today. Um, in the case of uh, cold dark matter and baryons, on top of this shape, uh, this qualitative shape that I have discussed, we have to add these small wiggles that comes from the fact that baryons are tightly coupled to photons. And therefore, until they are coupled to photons, uh, we have seen that they experience these acoustic oscillations uh, before having the possibility to catch up with the uh, cold dark matter perturbations. These are the so-called baryon acoustic oscillations that provide another powerful uh, cosmological probe uh, of the uh, properties of the expanding universe. In the case of neutrinos, instead, we have to take into account the free streaming nature of neutrinos. So we need to define a scale, which is the scale at which they become non-relativistic and therefore at which the free streaming uh, behavior becomes to, um, to be important for the evolution of neutrino perturbations. And in fact, we observe that 
on scales that are smaller than the free streaming scale, there is a net suppression of the uh, power spectrum for neutrinos with respect to the power spectrum uh, of the other uh, matter components, both cold dark matter and baryonic matter. Um, this, uh, I will leave uh, here the slides uh, that, that describes more in details what I have discussed uh, um, on, on this picture. And before moving to, uh, to CMB, we don't have really much time to discuss CMB today if we want to have some questions. So let me stop here and see if there are any questions or comments. Uh, and we will see if we have time to say a few words uh, to introduce cosmic microwave background today. But let me stop here for the moment. So I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Martina. Thank you. So questions now for Martina either in the chat or please raise your hand. So um, let me see if we have questions. If we have questions. Questions to our lecture, lecture sorry. So you can type them. I mean, I guess that after they will become very lively, but now they are a bit shy, maybe, of asking. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that there are a lot of info. Either there are a lot of information that have to be digested in, uh, in a very short time, or they are so common knowledge that there are really no questions to be asked, so. Yeah. So Martina, between hot and colder matter, there is also the option of warmer matter, right? In that case, yes. uh, the structure formation does occur in a in a top in a bottom top uh, way, right? But there is also suppression, right, of, mm -hmm. the, of the of the of the of the. Yeah, yeah. In the case of, of yeah. warm, uh, uh, yeah. In the case of warm dark matter, we have a um, uh, qualitatively similar behavior to the hot dark matter in a sense that we have suppression of the power spectrum at very small scales, but this suppression is pushed uh, to even smaller scales compared to the case of, uh, of hot dark matter. And this is because the, um, the thermal velocity of warm dark matter is still large, but not as large uh, as the uh, thermal velocity of uh, uh, very light particles such as uh, the the active or standard neutrinos. So yes, we have a yeah. suppression, but this suppression is more or less at the level of uh, the galactic size, let's say. So it was historically um, used uh, as a way to explain uh, the uh, so-called uh, satellite problems. So the fact that there were um, yeah. much less uh, um, small galaxies than one we would uh, uh, predict uh, in uh, in standard cosmology, and one possibility was that uh, a fraction uh, or a si the total or a significant fraction of the dark matter was in the form of a warm dark matter components that was suppressing the formation of very small cosmological structures. Okay, so thank you very much. So questions for Martina, more questions. I guess they are waiting to ask you this afternoon all, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. If there are no uh, questions, I will use the next few. We have until 1.30, right? Correct. You are right, Martina. Absolutely right. Okay. Yeah. So I will use just the, uh, the last few minutes to introduce the uh, cosmic microwave background and see that's Where fine. We can we'll go. from this mm -hmm. extra time. Thank you, Martina. Okay. Please go ahead, please. So uh, we have seen so far how matter perturbations evolve, and now we would like to understand uh, what is the behavior of the uh, anisotropies that we observe in the cosmic microwave background. The the CMB. I will refer to it as CMB from, from now on, is the leftover radiation of, uh, of the Big Bang. Uh, and uh, uh, after decoupling from, uh, um, from matter, so um, uh, yeah, after the recombination epoch and decoupling from, uh, from matter, uh, these CMB photons were reshifted due to the expansion of the universe and, um, and cooled down. 
because of the uh, very efficient interactions in the early universe, the um, distribution uh, of, uh, of CMB was an equilibrium uh, distribution and remained uh, an equilibrium distribution. And therefore, uh, today we observe it to be a black body spectrum, uh, almost perfect black, black body spectrum, uh, in a sense that we do not observe any significant deviations uh, from the, the shape of a black body spectrum as a function of frequency. Uh, the so-called spectral distortions that quantify how much the um, distribution of the CMB intensity as a function of frequency deviates uh, from the black body spectrum are very, very tiny. Um, and today, the, uh, the temperature of this uh, CMB uh, black body spectrum is measured uh, very precisely to be the value that we see in, um, in this slide. Um, so 2.7 uh, Kelvin, more or less, which corresponds to 2.3, 10 to the minus 4 uh, uh, EV. This is the uh, average temperature, but on top of this temperature, um, the standard model predicts uh, tiny fluctuations in, uh, in intensity, and we will see also in polarization. And the very cool thing is that not only the standard model predicts uh, these fluctuations, but we have been able to observe these fluctuations very, very precisely, both in temperature and polarization. And this represents another um, extremely good uh, um, uh, prediction of the standard model, extremely good success uh, of the standard model of, um, of cosmology. Let's see how these, uh, these tiny fluctuations uh, evolved uh, from the time, uh, from the early universe to the current time. So if we go back to early times uh, and we assume that there is a perfect balance between uh, gravitation, uh, gravitational collapse or gravitational effects uh, and the uh, pressure support provided by radiation, uh, there will be no uh, dynamics uh, in, uh, in the fluid. But luckily, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, perturbations that were introduced uh, uh, primordially uh, creates uh, small uh, deviations from these equilibrium situations. And these uh, small deviations from the equilibrium were the uh, seeds of the acoustic waves that started propagating into the uh, baryon photon fluid. At early times, baryon and photons were tightly coupled because of the interactions that connected uh, both of them. And uh, these small deviations from equilibrium uh, kicks in uh, acoustic waves propagation in this uh, uh, baryon photon fluid. And the typical um, length that was covered by this uh, acoustic oscillation is the uh, sound horizon which is given by this expression in the slide uh, here. Basically, it's the distance that can be covered by an acoustic wave um, until a given time uh, t with uh, a given sound speed uh, uh, cs. To fully describe the evolution of uh, CMB fluctuations, we need, uh, as usual, to evolve uh, the uh, set of Boltzmann equations for CMB fluctuations. And this set is, uh, can be very complicated because uh, differently from cold dark matter, when we just need to know the evolution of density uh, and, uh, and velocity, because cold dark matter can be represented as a perfect fluid. In the case of uh, CMB, we need the full set of uh, infinite uh, uh, Boltzmann hierarchy uh, for, uh, uh, for CMB and isotropies. Um, luckily enough, uh, we don't really need to evolve this full set of equations because we can um, understand some qualitative uh, um, properties of the CMB uh, field uh, if we restrict to, uh, the, um, to the stage of tight coupling uh, with, uh, with baryons. So if we are deep in the regime of tight coupling between photons and baryons, then we can treat photons and baryons as a perfect fluid. So we only need to understand how the monopole, uh, which corresponds to the density, and the dipole, which corresponds to the velocity of the CMB fields uh, evolve. And we can write down similarly to what we have done for the evolution of cold dark matter perturbations before, a single second order differential equation for, uh, um, for these terms. 
for the monopole terms. Uh, and this is the, the Boltzmann equation for uh, uh, the evolution of the monopole term of CMB in the regime of uh, tight coupling. Uh, in this equation here, uh, there are some important quantities. One is R, which is the ratio between the energy density in baryons and the energy density in photons. And since uh, these two energy densities are scaling differently with the scale factor, because baryons scale as a to the cube and photons scale as a to the fourth, uh, this ratio depends on the scale factor. The other quantity is the sound speed. Uh, which depends also on the uh, ratio between uh, photons and, uh, and baryons, because at some point uh, tight coupling uh, uh, will not be efficient anymore, and therefore the sound speed will move from the sound speed of a perfectly relativistic species when radiation dominates to the sound speed uh, of a, a non-relativistic component where instead uh, the, the baryons start to take over uh, photons. And finally, we have uh, uh, terms that depends on the uh, perturbations to the metric, so it's a gravitationally uh, driving terms that makes this equation for the evolution of the monopole the equation of a um, driven uh, oscillator, where uh, we recognize the Hubble friction term here. Uh, and the, um, uh, the driving term here that instead uh, is, uh, is given by the effect of, uh, uh, of gravity. The solution to this equation is very simple if we are deep in the radiation domination epoch, because in this case we can neglect anything but uh, radiation. So we can also neglect uh, this driving term here and the, um, and the equation uh, and also, sorry, if uh, photons dominate over baryons, we can also neglect the effect of R, and therefore we are left with the equation of a simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, we know the solution to uh, the simple harmonic oscillator, uh, which is the uh, acoustic waves uh, uh, expressed, um, expressed here. So the monopole term is evolving as the cosine of this term uh, K uh, sound, um, the size of the um, uh, acoustic horizon, plus a phase uh, which um, inflation predicts to be independent on the scale factor. This is another important prediction of, uh, of inflation. Uh, inside the sound horizon, this is the behavior of the monopole term, whereas outside the, sign, the sound horizon, where uh, this term uh, is um, um, uh, is basically uh, negligible. Uh, the, uh, the monopole term is frozen to the initial value that is given by inflation and independent of the scale factor. If we start to move to the epoch of matter, of matter domination, then the um, simplified expression that we have worked out uh, when we neglect uh, the term on the right hand side and we neglect the effect of uh, uh, the baryon to photon ratio uh, cannot be applied anymore, of course, because uh, at that time uh, baryons are dominating over photons. So we need to reintroduce the effect of, uh, of gravity and we also need to account for the fact that baryons are dominating over photons and therefore the, um, the ratio uh, of the two quantities and the sound speed uh, are, are changing with respect to what we have seen before. In particular, the ratio is growing because baryons are growing with respect to photons and uh, the sound speed is decreasing because we have a, a dominant matter component with respect to radiation. So the solution to the harmonic oscillator is changing because of these new effects. Uh, and the net result is that the amplitude of the oscillation is damped um, and the uh, zero point of the oscillations is moved to another value with respect to the zero point during the epoch of radiation domination, because now we have the uh, driving effect uh, of the gravitational uh, of the gravitational potentials and of uh, baryon loading. Another effect uh, that we have to take into account is the fact that uh, as soon as we move uh, towards the epoch of uh, uh, decoupling of recombination and decoupling, the tight coupling uh, approximation is compromised. Uh, 
uh, is compromised because the expansion rate uh, is increasing uh, at the interaction rate that keeps uh, baryon and photons coupled, uh, tightly coupled to each other, cannot counterbalance it, the expansion anymore. When this happens, uh, we start seeing photons that propagate freely in between two different interactions with, uh, with electrons. And uh, the effect of this uh, uh, non-zero mean free path between two different interactions or scattering with, uh, with electrons is more or less similar to the free streaming effect that we have discussed for, uh, uh, for neutrinos. Basically, all the perturbations that happen on scales that are smaller uh, than the uh, mean free path or diffusion length uh, for photons are completely erased. And we have a, a exponential dumping of the amplitude of uh, photon perturbations or photon fluctuations on scales that are smaller than this diffusion length. So on top of the oscillations that are um, dumped and moved to a different zero point because of baryons and gravitational effects, we also have this additional exponential suppression that comes from the fact that photons are slowly decoupling uh, from, uh, uh, from baryons. And uh, um, this picture is telling you exactly what I've discussed so far, because the dashed lines uh, uh, corresponds to the evolution of the uh, monopole terms <clears throat> at, the time, uh, at a time that was deep in the radiation domination epoch. So we have almost uh, um, uh, invariant amplitudes of the acoustic waves uh, as a function of, uh, of the wave number. Uh, the solid line instead is the evolution of the monopole term, uh, more or less at the time of recombination. So uh, after matter radiation equality, when uh, um, radiation is subdominant with respect to matter. And we see a completely different behavior where the amplitude is dumped with respect to the dashed case, so with respect to the radiation domination epoch, and the zero point of the oscillation is also moved to another value. And on top of this, if you look at the amplitude of the uh, different peaks, you see an exponential envelope that is decreasing the amplitude of the oscillations because of uh, um, photon diffusion. Okay, sorry, we are six minutes after 1.30, I, I haven't no realized problem. that. No problem. We can, yeah, we can yeah, stop, uh, yeah, yeah. We can stop here and continue uh, this afternoon. Okay, so we shall uh, uh, meet again, right? Um, in yeah. like uh, one hour and a half, okay? Okay. And Thank if you, you have any questions, feel free to either to write me or to ask me in Gather Town. I'll be happy to answer that. Thank you very much, Martina, for your kindness.